Hello everybody and uh, welcome to one more uh, webinar on the continuation of the topography that we discussed last evening and abrometry in clinical practice. For those who have joined us newly, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Aravind. I work as a cornea and anterosegment consultant for the Tej Kohli Cornea Institute at the KVC campus of LV Prasad I Institute, Vijayawad in India. We have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. So while I start the lecture, let's uh, get the first poll question ready for the audience. Please uh, state your position. Okay, so most of us uh, who have joined us today are ophthalmologists, 77% and residents or registrars, 18% and mixed group are 5. So good, so let's start the discussion. Uh, like uh, the format that we did in the last discussion, we will have an interactive kind of a discussion and please feel free to interrupt at any point of time send your questions, I will try my best to answer your queries or your doubts. So I will start my discussion with the second poll question that what would you understand by optical wavefronts and in which of the following statements would best describe optical wavefronts. So there are four choices, uh, please feel free to select anything that best describes this uh, physical phenomenon. So typically, light passes through yeah so most of the participants have uh, correctly answered that all the above so when light passes through any optical media it actually gets diffracted or refracted through a three-dimensional uh, array and that is the wavefront and that if it is a perfect wavefront it would have a particular orientation which would differ from person to person. For example, that whenever light passes through any optical medium, then there is an ideal way in which it would get refracted if there are no imperfections in the optical system. But if there are imperfections in the optical system, such as, for example, in the eye, when there are imperfections in the cornea, in the lens, or any of the uh, conducting media between the cornea to the retina, then the imperfections would be uh, different at different points of time across the pupil size. So there will be a difference between the way it ideally should have been and the way it actually is. This difference is the wavefront and they are the, those waves which are in the same line of diffraction are in phase and they are measured from the source by the path length. So those wavefronts which are in the same phase are in the same path length and those who are different are quite different from the others. So they may be in forward or behind the ideal reference plane. So all the aberrometers which measure aberrations in the eye uh, are based on a Shiner principle or in the Schernings principle. So basically the Shiner disc is a very simple instrument which is a disc which has two holes in it. So as shown by this cartoon over here, the reference ray that passes through the central axis of the eye passes undeflected. The aberrometer actually adjusts the test ray which is at the periphery either through a horizontal or vertical angle as denoted by alpha and beta so that it comes into a point focus at the 
comment where the reference ray cuts into the retina. So basically by measurements of the alpha and beta, one can calculate the degree of aberrations across the pupil. So this is inherent in the hartmann shack lenslet array, which is used in most of the aberrometers. So there is a lenslets, which are a set of lenses and any ray that passes through them, uh, through the pupil, actually goes into minor arrays of this lenslet as uh, shown in this cartoon and then they are captured by the video camera and processed by the computer. From that they calculate the aberrations of the eye. Now one can calculate the aberrations of the eye either by passing rays of light into the eye or they can use a laser source which when reflected from the eye passes through the lenslet array and is uh, analyzed after passing through the hartmann shack lenslet into the sensor. So this is basically the output from the pupil. So the pupil is the circular thing that you are seeing here and each minor dot is actually the rays of light or the pencil of rays of light that are emerging from the retina and as they pass through the pupillary side, pupillary aperture, there will be several aberrations that they suffer when they pass through the optical medium of the eye, which produces a composite structure which can be represented by a composite wafer that in that in turn can be a component, a component of several such aberrations. For example, the normal aberration that is recorded from the human eye can have a component of defocus, astigmatism, coma, triangular astigmatism and spherical astigmatism. I would like to take questions at this point of time if you have any and we will also be pro proceeding with the talk. Okay. So just to recap, there is a laser light through which uh, which passes through the lenslet arrays of the hartmann shack sensor and then they produces a, a composite wavefront which can have several components of defocus, astigmatism, coma, triangular, spherical astigmatism, trifoil or quadrifoil. So we have one quick question now, let me take that. Yeah. Uh, one of our viewers have asked, does defocus mean refractive error? Well, a refractive error is actually a combination of sphere and cylinder and all those components of the vision that cannot be corrected by the spherical cylinder actually fall into the uh, category of the higher order aberration. So yes, defocus would mean a refractive error, that's correct. Okay. So we'll go to the next uh, poll question that which of these are higher order aberrations? Till defocus, I just partly answered this question. So I think this would be easy. Okay, so, so as most of the viewers have correctly answered, it is uh, trefoil, pentafoil, coma and spherical aberrations which would be the higher order aberrations, which affect vision significantly. So we'll be learning more about this in the subsequent uh, slides. So when the aberrations are analyzed, they are split into several components. Now. These can be adjusted by several mathematical equations. They could be a Taylor analysis, a Fourier analysis, or a Zernike polynomial. Sorry. So, Zernike polynomials are the common way of denoting the aberrations of the eye. So, they keep on ex expanding exponentially as the rays of light get complexly refracted from the optical media of the eye. So as you can see, the apex of this pyramid of polynomials, those are tilt 
and the second would be the astigmatism and defocus which we discussed now and then they keep on progressing into trifoil coma and astigmatism tetrafoil pentafoil quadrafoil and into more complex features now we the common aberrometers in clinical practice is the the obscan 2z platform so it typically gives a output as you can see in your screens which has a wavefront and that by a higher order wavefront so the colors that you see over here are actually which beams of light are in phase and which beams of light are not in phase meaning that those beams of rays which are in phase are shown by one pattern or one concentric circle that you are seeing over here over a particular pupil size so meaning that all reds are in phase and all blues are also in phase but those reds are actually far ahead compared to the blues which are behind so that produces a conical or a complex kind of a wave shape as you can see and this is a three dimensional structure now if you just look at the polynomial here the defocus would be something like this the reds are ahead and the blue is behind and there are other components also to the screen which uh, to the output that is which we shall be discussing now so this is the tab selection which gives you the the number of ways the data can be displayed the summary 2d plot the ppr which is the coropter predictor diffraction which is nothing but the auto refraction which is done by the machine and the higher order point source function and then there is a set of data points over here so the map on your right is the higher order map the map on your left is the total wavefront map the data below is the total data and this is an interesting function which we will uh, discuss on in later uh, slides so this is the higher order point spread function or the foveola test which is a key concept in understanding interpretation of maps okay so any questions at this point of time so the data overview typically from any patient would have the eye which is examined whether it's the pre op or post op the dilatation of the pupil the diameter of the wavefront which is important for refractive surgery the maximum undilated pupil size that will help you plan the treatment the refraction and the coropter predicted refraction at 3.5 mm pupil and the full ppr then it gives you the zernike values which are typically described over a 5 or 6 mm pupil in terms of micro so it could be some value for the 5 mm and the higher order zernike is without the z400 the z400 is typically for spherical aberrations so this two values are very important in interpreting the aberrometry map because there are the absolute degree of higher order aberration that are denoted by this figure which is the 6 mm size and the higher order zernike without the spherical aberration which is denoted by the value below so this tells us that how much is the impact of the spherical aberrations on the total aberrations of the eye this is a important thing to note when you are reading the aberrometry map that what is your total aberrations and what is your aberration without the z400 or the impact of the spherical aberrations okay please ask any questions in case you have any doubts at this point of time okay so while understanding the complexities of aberration this would be a very useful article to refer to and this article suggests several key points in the interpretation of aberrations so there are several important key concepts that one should understand that the light rays from the center of the pupil play greater role in defining the visual acuity or the style's crop fold effect secondly specific wave fronts which are near to the center of the zernike pyramid such as the coma or the spherical aberrations tend to affect retinal image quality maximally 
as compared to those which are at the edge of the pyramid. Third, various combinations of vibrations can either improve or decrease the quality of the retinal image. And it depends upon the amount of each apparition that are there and the way they are combined. Neural processing is different for different apparitions and the plasticity of the neural processing is also different in different individuals. So this is a very interesting article to understand concepts of apparitions. We have one more question. Okay, so the Zarnik pyramid is actually as discussed in a couple of slides earlier. When we try to fit the aberrations by mathematical models, we can use several analysis techniques. One could be the Fourier, the Taylor, or the Zarnik. So as the, the way the rays get diffracted becomes more and more complex, the patterns in which it can be fitted into models are, or these are mathematical models basically for the wavefront, are increasing exponentially. So in the apex of so that when we see in perspective is the Zarnike pyramid that we had discussed some, some slides ago. So for your reference, let me just go back to that. Okay. Yeah, so as it increases in complexity, the pyramid builds up. So at the apex, there is tilt and piston, which is basically unrefracted. And as it increases in complexity, the base becomes more and more broader. So this would be the learning. Okay. So we have discussed these key concepts, which will be helpful in understanding the way it operations affect visual uh, function. So with this, we go to the fourth uh, all question, which higher order aberrations are clinically significant? Okay. So Yeah, so the majority have uh, answered that coma and spherical aberrations are visually significant. Yes, that is correct. Most of the aberrations that are of clinical significance are coma and spherical aberrations. And this will be followed by the other higher order aberrations. But probably in the neural visual processing, these may not play significant role. So when we talk about aberrations, we need to understand that this is a complete optical phenomenon and it is not only limited to the corneal aberrations. So it is the total aberration of the eye because when the eye diffracts the rays of light, it passes through various optical media, naming the cornea, aqueous lens and the vitreous before reaching the retina. So the aberrations that are measured are total they involve the entire optics of the eye and they are also analyzed in total and they in turn are processed by the neural processing of the brain which affect the visual function finally. Coma and spherical aberration play a very important role in uh, the vision. So we are going to discuss a little bit in detail about coma and spherical aberration. So spherical aberration would typically appear or may be denoted as this on the figure on your right is actually the aberration, total aberration map and on your left is the foveola test. So the foveola test is that how would a point source of light appear to an observer when there is lot of spherical aberrations. So there would be typically a spider web kind of a pattern or a typical halo. Uh, again observe the foveola test. So this will be a typical halo and there would be spider web patterns and then look at the measurement of the higher order aberrations. The higher order aberrations for RMS for 6 millimeter is something like 0.58 microns and without the Z400 which is typically the spherical aberration is 0.27. So a difference of 0.31 or larger 
suggests that there is a dominant effect of spherical aberration on the total aberrations of the eye. So whenever you see an aberration map and you see a point source function, if it is circular or like a halo having a spiderweb kind of appearance, you can understand that this kind of aberrations are dominated by spherical aberration compared to the other aberrations. And if there is a coma, then the coma, as the name suggests, would have a comet-like appearance and there will be one apex end and a base, as seen by this foveola test over here. And typically, there will be very little effect of the Z400. So if you see the Z400 and the total aberrations of the eye, there is hardly any difference. The higher order aberration for 6 millimeters is 0.78 and the higher order aberration without the Z400 is 0.76, so almost no difference. And you see a foveolar test which is like a co comet and there is a small contribution of the spherical aberration. So this is a kind of aberrated eye where spherical aberration plays a lesser role. Okay, so foveolar test we have already discussed. It depends on the total aberrations of the eye. The display is without the second order aberrations. So the image quality is stimulated with the best spectacle correction and, and it also shows that how a point source of light would appear to the observer. Okay. Any further questions at this point of time? <clears throat> okay. So we have just had an overview of the several concepts of uh, aberration, how to, how aberration is measured, what is the principle and how we need to interpret and understand how much of aberrations play a role in our visual function. So continuing a quick recap of what we discussed on topography last, there are several topographers. There are topographers which are not only just measuring the corneal topography but gives different functions which help in the day-to-day -day clinical practice. So I will conclude the part of the discussion from the last webinar on topography about choosing a topographer or a barometer which would suit your practice well. So I'll go to the fifth poll question. What does the topographer that you commonly use in your clinical practice? So most of our users are using Pentacam followed by the Offscan. And then there are some of our viewers who are using the NIDEF, Atlas and Tommy. Okay. So we will have a quick overview of the topographers that are in commercial use and see what is best suited for which function and how it may potentially affect your practice. So topographers can have different principles on which they work. Typically, they may be reflection based, including the keratometry, photokeratoscopy or video keratoscopy, projection based like raster or laser interferometry, slit scanning like the off scan, shine plug based, which may be pentacam, calendar or series, OCT based and spot reflection based or hybrid topographers like the iTRIS. So choosing a topographer depends upon the kind of practice that you have. So if you predominantly have a refractive practice and do some amount of cataract, then probably you can be aided in this by a pentacam, Galilei, or any of the placido based systems. If you predominantly are a cataract surgeon and also do some amount of refractive surgery, then you would prefer to have a topographer with an aberrometer also. So in this, you may choose a off-scan, OPD or a iTRIS. So, I have one question now about what is eye design wavefront. Uh, I am not very clear about that, but if you'd like, maybe you can have a private chat and 
detail your question, please. Okay, so going to the first general of the topographers which were based on a Placido system. So it was the keratoscope or the Placido. This is time tested and this is the standard of care for a long, long time in clinical ophthalmology. In this article on chasing the suspect, Dr. Kleis speaks about the form thrust keratoconus, which has an abnormal abortive kind of a syndrome, which typically does not evolve into keratoconus, and there are no signs of keratoconus in the other eye, as opposed to the keratoconic suspect, which definitely has a disorder of the topography, but there is no clinical evidence of keratoconus in either of the eye. So the keratoscope or a placebo-based topographer is a reflection-based topographer and it picks up minute corneal irregularities. Pentacam has been widely in use and in addition to topography, it has several other useful features. So it can be used for a decision on premium IOL, can give you a cataract preoperative scan, gives you a densitometry map to know the density of the lens, the cataract grading is helpful. It has a quality equivalent K reading report, which is useful for planning IOL in the post refractive surgery setup. And it provides a useful criteria called the Berlin Ambrosio Enhanced Ectasia Display. So the output from the Pentacam typically has these four components to it. So there is an action sagittal curvature. the elevation maps, the corneal thickness, and the front and back elevations. So there is a reference surface and anything which is above six diopters and up six points above the reference for the front elevation and 12 above the back elevation are considered to be normal. In addition, it gives an array of numerical data, which is on your right that gives the pupil center, the apex packy, the thinnest packy, the corneal volume, the anterior chamber depth, etc. It also provides summary statistics where deviation from normal parameters are flagged in red. This is the display of the Berlin Ambrosio Enhanced Ectasia display and it provides the progression index which is 1.2 Though 11% of keratoconic eyes also fall into the normal category. It provides the summary of the front back elevation, the difference between that and the difference between the packy values. The corneal thickness profile is also shown by a red line as two subcategories of CTSP, which is the corneal thickness spatial profile and the percentage thickness index. And the average is following the central line, which is the medium for the demographic population and the two lines which are above and below are two standard deviations above and below. So any line that crosses the two standard deviations is probably an abnormal parameter. Okay. The CIRAS is another platform for uh, topography. It uses also a Scheinflug uh, principle and it uses, in addition to topography, it provides several useful clinical data, such as the lens densitometry analysis, the glaucoma analysis, nebography and dry eye evaluation, keratoconic screening indices, and contact lens fitting. It provides topography data in terms of a summary maps of corneal thickness, tangential curvature, anterior and posterior elevation maps. It provides a keratoconic summary by keratoconus indices and corneal maps. And dry eye evaluation is done by detection of dry spots on the anterior corneal tear film. And mobography can be done by study of the neurogen glands. Contact lens fitting is another useful feature of the series. It uh, has on its database contact lenses of different manufacturers and one can actually assess the fit and see what is the fluorescent pooling pattern. 
based on the output maps that are in the contact lens uh, fitting analysis uh, feature of this topographer. The Galilei is another useful unit which has a double shine flow camera. Advantage of a double shine flow camera is that it gives a true measurement of the cornea, including the angle cata. The G6 software for IOL power calculation helps in giving an accurate calculation of the intraocular lens. Keratoconus predictor analysis indices are much more sensitive and it gives a best fit to the Caspian. Now, most of topographers give the best fit sphere. The best fit toric asphere, aspheric surface is actually a newer evaluation which is much more sensitive in detecting subclinical keratoconus. Uh, this is the calculation software for intraocular lenses. And as I was discussing earlier, the unit gives the anterior and the posterior best fit toric asphheric surface. So these are very sensitive to detect any subclinical keratoconus and all the keratoconic probability indices are also given as one map in the bottom right of the display. So technically, any indices which is more than 22 or the corneal volume more than 30.8 or a packy value of 508 or more are typically suitable for a laser refractive procedure. So this can also be very accurately measured and determined from point to point across a large area of the cornea. The OPSCAN is one of the trusted, tried and very familiar unit in any clinical ophthalmology practice. It has been there for quite some time and it has evolved from the Jenner first Jenner to the OPSCAN 2Z and now there's an OPSCAN 3. So the diagnostic criteria for keratoconus are very specific. And in addition, there is also a white to white, which is very helpful for calculation of implantable polymer lenses. So if you look at this off-scan map, this is quite obviously a keratoconic eye. And there are a set of red flags, which are important in interpreting the off-scan. So one is the ratio of the anterior to the posterior best fit sphere. This should not be about 1.27. So I'm talking basically about the, the elevation BFS, which is 42.8 for the anterior float. And it is 49.9 for the posterior float. So as per this red flags for the off scan, this ratio should not be more than 1.27. The posterior best fit sphere should not be above 55 diopters. Okay, so this should not be above 55, the max K that is there. Then on the posterior float, oh, I'm sorry, I just, let me reach it again. The, the posterior best fit sphere should not be above 55. This is the red flag, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Yeah. <laughs> Then the other parameter that one should look for is that on the posterior flow, there will be a high point which is demarcated by the red color and there will be a low point which will be by the deep blue or the violet. So when you add up these two, this should not go above 100. So whenever you place your cursor on the off scan machine, this will display a value. So this would be either 20, 30, 35, 40, something. And the same, this would also be another value, which would be 30, 20, 40. So whenever you add these two, this is the typically the elevation and this is the trough. So the difference for the adding these two should not go above 100. This is another criteria for keratoconus. Then there is the corneal thickness index. And this is basically the ratio between the central packing and the peripheral packing. This should not be 1.16. And then there should not be a asymmetric or broken bow tie as it is seen over here. And the irregularity in the three and five millimeter zone should not be more than 1.5 for the three millimeter zone and more than 2.5 for the five millimeter zone. 
So if there are, so and then when we interpret a suspicious map, there is a one, two, three rule. So if there is one abnormal map, one should be cautious. If there are two abnormal maps, then there is a cause for concern. And if there are three abnormal maps, then it is definitely a contraindication for refractive procedures. The other newer uh, topographers are the Cassetti, which uses color LED lights to map the corneal topography from the front and the back surface of the cornea. So these, the distance between the lights is measured to know the elevation of one point of the cornea. This can also be integrated to the Lensar laser system for femtocatarate surgery. The eye trace helps in evaluating aberrations. It uses a dynamic skyoscopy for evaluating the optical aberrations. It is useful for planning the intraocular lenses and it also has several parameters by which we can know the quality of vision. So any questions up to this point of time? Okay. So it's very common to have patients in your clinic who would be uh, having discomfort in night driving or difficulty with night vision. And at the same time, they are in their mid fifties or sixties with not a very significant cataract. So when we see these patients and check for their aberrations, it's not uncommon to find that there is a lot of higher order aberrations. So this could be either a preclinical or a subclinical kind of early lenticular opacification, which is changing the aberrations of the eye and causing a distortion of the visual phenomenon, especially in dim light when the pupil is slightly larger in size. So this this entity is also called as a dysfunctional lens syndrome and this may also warrant a early intervention in terms of a cataract extraction. So these subtle findings of the density of the lens, the change in the aberrations with the increase in internal higher order aberrations can actually warrant and help the clinical uh, clinician to go for the early cataract surgery. The OPD3 from NIDEC is another platform which can help in many ways in addition to topography. It can act as an autokeratometer, it can be a topographer and it can help in giving a cataract summary analysis which can help for toric IOL planning. In addition, one can also take photography of the meibomian glands and thus it can act as a nipographer and help in the dry eye evaluation in picking up dropout of the gland or dry spots. Okay, any questions up to this point of time? Okay. So when we see across the board, these are some of the common uh, topographers that are in clinical use. One is the pentacan which is very widely used as also seen by our poll. Most of our users are using Pentacam in their clinical practice. It has an elevation display. It has a Bellin and Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display. It helps in premium IOL planning and in ERK maps. So this is widely used and accepted. However, it may be a little expensive compared to the other topographers that are in use. The OPSCAN is time tested. It has very clear criteria for detecting keratoconus. It has been in the clinics for quite some time. So there is a lot of familiarity with these maps. And it gives the white to white, which helps us plan the ICL parameters. The Galilei is not widely used, but it is emerging slowly. It has the G6 software for accurate IOL calculations and it also gives several important keratoconic parameters, such as the best fit, toric aspheric reference surface. The CIRAS is helpful for both keratoconic indices and the dry eye. In addition, it can have a role in your contact lens practice and helps in detection of dry eye by mevography. However, again, it is not widely used. 
the OPD3 has a aberrometer in addition to its other roles, it may have repeatability issues. The Cassini is good to accurately measure the posterior astigmatism. It may be helpful to plan your premium IOLs factor for the posterior astigmatism, but then again, it may have some difference in its measurements compared to the other commercially available topographers. So the need of a good topographer for a cataract and refractive surgeon can be manifold. And it also depends on what kind of data that you use commonly. So if there are refractive indices and there is a keratoconic screening and a wide, wide variety of refractive surgeries that you come around in your practice, then a pentacam or a placido-based system can be more useful. The Q value is best measured by a placido-based system, which is the amount of corneal aspericity. And it, this can be useful to optimize the I will or do a topographic treatment. The white to white value is calculated best for, for ICL calculations by the OFSCAN. Mimography can be done by the CIRUS and biometry can be done by the G6 software for the I will calculation by the Galilei. So I would like to thank my colleagues who have helped with the material. And I would also like to take questions from all on any other uh, doubts or any other key concepts that you might like to discuss with me on this. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, one question. Uh, excuse me, I just uh, lost my slides. Okay, so we have one question about uh, how Q value affects the vision. So Q value is the degree of corneal aspericity that is there. So whenever there is a high degree of corneal aspericity, the quality of vision may suffer. And in these cases, you would preferably implant a aspheric IOL. So this is probably a good indication to use any of the aspheric IOLs in common clinical use, such as the IQ or the thickness or the Bosch and Lohm adaptive optics uh, intraocular lens. Uh, one of the questions are about aberrometry. Okay, the one of the articles that I have shown in my slide. This uh, is a good read to people who want to understand aberrometry. These are the making sense of the of wavefront sensing by J. Pepos and uh, Raymond Applegate in AJO 2005. And from there, you can definitely branch out and read different aspects of it. Okay, we have some more questions. The calculation of uh, IOL post LASIK. There are several calculations by which you can do. The clinical history method is very accurate. One can also do a uh, post contact lens over refraction. And you can also use for real time the several software that are incorporated in either your G6 software in Galilei, or you can use the uh, the iTrace. So there are several such software which are now coming incorporated in your IOL calculating uh, units that are there in addition to topography. And you can also use an online Warren Hills calculator to calculate the intraocular lens that you need to implant post uh, refractive surgery.
Okay, so one more question that is coming up is what is the use of aberrometry in refractive surgery? This is a very interesting question. So there are two ways of looking at this. So one of it is that there is something called as the wavefront optimized refractive surgery and the other which is called as the wavefront guided refractive surgery or the wavefront guided ablation. So wavefront optimized ablation is basically that the a blend zone is created at the periphery of the ablation so that there is no abrupt areas of ablated and non-ablated cornea because the cornea is a prolate steroid and those areas which are on the periphery of the ablation may not have the same density of the ablating laser laser that is being done there as compared to the central body. This would be the category of wavefront optimized ablation because there are blend zones. The wavefront guided ablation would probably be where you would not only correct for the power of the eye but would also attempt to correct the preoperative higher order aberrations so that you at least do not end up with more higher order aberrations than you would normally expect if you had corrected without factoring in the aberrations. I hope uh, my answer is clear to you. And if we do a wavefront customized ablation, the hypothesis is that typically these treatments are more accurate, induce less higher order aberrations and the quality of vision is better. However, studies which have been done in using both the techniques have found that the results are pretty much similar, whether they are both myopic or hyperopic corrections. Okay, we have some more time here. Any further questions? Okay, uh, aberration having any relation with age and gender? Yes, uh, where with the aging eye, the density of the lens changes and that may affect the quality of vision. Gender, probably no. And a patient presenting with a sudden increase in cylindrical power and obstetrics is normal. Um, unlikely, it can, but uh, unlikely, usually, if there is a corneal component to the trace in cylinder, then there will be a change in op scan. However, if it could be due to trauma or a tilt in the lens, or we are looking into a genetic condition like Marfan's or homocysteinuria, then a tilt in the lens may also produce a change in the cylindrical power. change of uh, during pregnancy, would you mean uh, the aberrometry or the topography by this change during pregnancy? Topography would definitely change during pregnancy due to the effect of the hormones and uh, also they revert back to normal about six to eight months after nursing. Is it necessary to check aberrations in all LASIK patients? Preoperatively, probably it's a good idea to have a record of the aberrations that are there. And you may choose to correct a higher amount of spherical aberrations by doing aspheric treatment or offering aspheric treatment. Then can the posterior corneal astigmatism affect calculation of IOL power in refractive surgery? Yes, it can do that. The, the orientation of the posterior cornea changes with age. 
and it needs to be factored in for your toric IOS. So technically, yes, it can affect your outcomes and also needs to be factored in and some of the newer algorithms in topographers factor in the poster astigmatism also. They also measure a component of the corneal astigmatism called the total corneal astigmatism, which is also crucial in planning your premium IOS. Uh, the other question that one of our viewers have asked is that, is the Zernik pyramid useful? Yes, Zernik pyramid is commonly used. It is helpful for researchers to discuss with each other about the degree of aberration that are there. It is useful to communicate with the patient and graphically present that what kind of aberrations are there in the component of total aberrations of the eye. And mostly the coma and the higher order aberrations are important visually. Inheritance is probably not very relevant. Though there are each there are changes in the way the lenses are in, in some congenital lenticular changes, then that may lead to similar kind of visual phenomena. I hope that answers your question. So I think we have a little bit of time left. So we'll be very happy to take any further questions that you, that you would have. Okay, we have one more question. Just let me see if this is okay. So the Allegretto versus the Visix. I think the Visix platform integrates the aberrations. Allegretto, I'm I'm not sure about. That. Does uh, post cataract persist in visual problems like arcuate flash means lens tilting? Uh, and if you mean that flashes that are seen by a patient who has been operated for cataract surgery, well, then that would mean that one needs to check the retina to see whether there are any breaks or any traction on the retina causing flashes or floaters. Uh, lens tilting would probably cause distortion of the images or may decrease in the quality and quantity of vision. If the retina is okay, then one should look into the total aberrations of the eye. Uh, 
one of our viewers have asked if the lecture is available online i think uh, lawrence can answer that for you and maybe you can get back to lawrence and get in touch with him the okay yeah i, I answered this question uh, about uh, this is a question about the difference between wavefront guided versus wavefront optimized so wavefront guided actually creates a blend zone so that there are zones between the treated and untreated cornea simply said and uh, the wavefront uh, sorry the wavefront optimized that is and the wavefront guided uh, laser is basically where you take into account the aberrations of the eye and try to decrease the higher order aberrations so you try to basically either bring down the total amount of aberrations that are induced by refractive surgery or decrease their what the amount of aberration that will be there post refractive surgery uh, does that answer your question So if uh, there are no further questions, then maybe we can end this session here. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure discussing the concepts with you. And I hope you also had a very informative session. Have a great day ahead. Thank you.